A salary is the drug they give you when they want you to forget about your dreams. Welcome to the Corporate Dropout Podcast. I'm your host, Alacia Citro. If you're sick of the corporate hamster wheel and looking to feel inspired and empowered to live a high vibe life as your own boss, you're in the right place. Dare to drop out in three, two, one. I want to introduce you to Danielle McCleary. She is a lifestyle entrepreneur, host of the On The Daily podcast, and the founder of Hype University. Hype University is a one-stop shop for entrepreneurs offering business coaching and other leadership training and personal development workshops. Currently, Danielle offers one-on-one human design readings, as well as a three-month coaching container called Transform, which is one-on-one coaching for the entrepreneur looking to transform their subconscious, their conscious mindset, and their product or service in order to create a business they fully align with on every level. To access any of these offerings, head on over to Danielle's Instagram at Danielle underscore on the daily and slide into the DMs using Upstarter pods to learn more. And don't forget to tune into on the daily, which releases new episodes every Tuesday and Friday. Hello, friends. Today, I am interviewing my dear friend, Emily Woodward. She is a registered nurse, a certified holistic health and wellness coach, and an internationally certified colon hydrotherapist. After 12 years in multiple surgical, medical, and neurotrauma intensive care units across the country, she became a hospital corporate dropout in 2021 to pursue her soul's purpose of helping women heal their hormones naturally. She is on a mission to unlock infinite health for each client she works with by educating and empowering them to live their healthiest, happiest, most vibrant lives. Her approach to healing encompasses high quality food, sustainable lifestyle choices, non-negotiable self-care, radical self-love, pleasure, joy, curiosity, and holistic healing of the body, mind, and spirit. Wow. How's that for a bio? Emily, thank you for being here and coming on the show. Alessia, thank you so much for having me. I just love when we get to spend time together and it's an honor to be on the show with you. Uh, I'm so happy to have you here. And I we have to like do story time really quick for the listener. So Emily and I met how many years ago was that six or seven? Maybe it had been a minute. Yeah, we met in 2016. She has the memory of an elephant, by the way, just so y'all know. (laughs) So yeah, so six years ago. um, And the way that we met, okay, so actually, hang on, let me fast forward. Earlier in March, we were on a retreat together and we roomed together and people were like, oh, how do y'all know each other? And we're like, this is actually the first time we've hung out in person outside of the setting in which we met, which I don't believe in TMI. And I think most of our listeners do not either. Um, Emily and I actually met and became fast friends when I was getting a colonic and she was the colon hydrotherapist. So that's a whole other level of closeness, right? It really is. I, and I remember vividly, I remember meeting you and how it was just instant connection. We bonded on so many levels. I was like, I really need to be friends with this girl. She's so amazing. And here we are all these years later. And I love that the one time we've ever hung out IRL uh, was recently, just a couple of weeks ago. And <laughs> other than that, a little up close and personal in the colon office, huh? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, people on this retreat thought that was so funny that like we've kept in touch for six years, but that was like the first time we'd actually hung out outside of the colon hydrotherapy office. So pretty funny. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. So funny. <laughs> uh, well, now that we have that out of the way, I, like I couldn't not tell that story on here. Like it's just hilarious and proof it, that you can meet people anywhere, right? Absolutely. It it was so funny because (laughs) we, yeah, again, we connected instantly and it was so funny because it was almost like we were friends having coffee and not cleansing or (laughs) in, in the uh, very intimate setting in which we met, you know? (laughs) Oh, totally. Yeah. I I love it. It's like, that's one of my favorite stories actually of how I've met a friend. (laughs) Me too. All right. So, so back to you (laughs) Enough about me and my colonics. (laughs) <laughs> so so take us back in time. How did you get into nursing? What called you to the profession? Like, give us the deets. Yeah, I knew I was going to be a nurse a long time ago because I've always been obsessed with anatomy and biology. I love cells and I just, I was really curious about the human body and I love people. And one day somebody said, you should be a nurse because that kind of combines everything. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's my job. That's what I'm going to do. And so I, so I knew probably freshman year in high school that I was going to be a nurse. And yeah, I went to the university of Missouri for my undergrad. I got my bachelor's in nursing in 2009. 
nine. And then I moved out east to Baltimore kind of on a whim. I was like, oh, I think the Johns Hopkins Hospital is like a good hospital. Maybe I'll work there. And I got a job there kind of right out of college. It was pretty exciting. (laughs) And um, I jumped right into the world of surgical intensive care unit, um, which is just amazing. And I was living my best nursing life. I was obsessed, Alicia, every single thing, dressing change, um, emergency, hanging a new medication, checking a medication, giving a bath, like all of it. I was obsessed with it. I really, really believed that I was going to be a nurse forever. It was just, it was filling me up so much. In fact, I remember telling family members and patients, like, like, you know, family members of patients, they'd say, man, you really seem to love what you do. And I told them, and I meant it with my whole heart. I said, I'm lucky they pay me because I would probably do this without pay. Like that is how much I loved being a nurse. So... Well, and as you can all tell from her bubbly personality, I don't know, you know, if all y'all listening have been in the hospital before. I fortunately have not been much, but I remember after having Mila, the nurse that was there when I delivered her, I just had such like a a special bond and appreciation with this woman. And man, like nurses like Emily, the world would be a better place if they were all like you. Oh, thank you. That means the world to me. You know, and I always, I always ask people whenever they have an experience in the hospital, I say, how was your nurse? Was he or she amazing? Because if they weren't fantastic, I almost take it personally because I feel like everybody needs to be amazing. Like people are in their most vulnerable states, physically, emotionally, they're scared. Oftentimes they're grieving. So to be that person who is a safe, loving presence, like everybody, and I always, always take it personally when people don't have great experiences with nurses, you know, (laughs) maybe that could be your next course, teaching people how to be bubbly, amazing nurses. Um, Okay. So, (laughs) right. I'm full. I'm full of business ideas. That's like what I live for. Love it. So, okay. Tell us more about your nursing career. Like how long were you doing it? What were some of the different things that you did? Um, and maybe like right up until your, your dropout story. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, from 2009 to 2013, I was in Baltimore at the Johns Hopkins hospital in surgical intensive care unit. And like I mentioned, every moment was amazing. And then, uh, in 2013, I decided to travel nurse and my travels brought me down to the South. I spent some time in Kentucky and then randomly I moved out to California, um, Southern California, where my life changed pretty profoundly in two big ways. Number one, about a week after I moved there, I met my now husband, Drew, who just caught my heart instantly and we fell in love and the rest is history. And (laughs) secondly, I started to meet people and learn things about natural health and wellness and healing, things that I had never heard of before. And I started, it's funny, I would meet one person and then that person would introduce me to like that book or that online summit or that lecture or something. And before I knew it, I was knee deep in all of the holistic health and wellness information. And my mind was blown, like beyond blown. I thought, how, how did I not know this? You know, because when it's funny, you know, how wisdom is often retrospective. I look back on those early years and, um, being a nurse and, witnessing all the things that I witnessed in the hospital, I really genuinely thought that I knew all there was to know about healing and kind of being exposed to this new, and it's not new, a lot of it's very old, ancient wisdom of healing, but um, being exposed to some of these new concepts, new to me, I started to, my world sort of started to unravel. I said, wait a second, how did I not know any of this stuff? How did I not know the timeless healing power of food? How did I not know that, you know, cleansing and lymphatic drainage and colon hydrotherapy? How did I not know that all of this augments healing on, on not only the physical plane, but, but beyond like the spiritual, the mind, the body, everything. And so after, after moving to California and learning all these cool things and meeting all these amazing people, um, I, I started to become more and more uncomfortable in my hospital job. And at that point I was working in a pre-op post-operative, uh, unit for cardiovascular and interventional radiology surgeries. So I was seeing a lot of people with heart disease, a lot of people, young people with cancer. I was seeing a lot of patients on dialysis. And this is kind of coinciding with all of my learning and my new paradigm shifts in in what I thought 
I knew healing was. And I just started to grow to be more and more uncomfortable in, in the settings that I found myself. So then, (laughs) then actually another crazy elephant memory moment of dates. I remember it was October 28th, 2015. And I was in anthropology buying a gift for a friend of mine. It was her birthday. And I walked in and I was feeling really like down about my job. I started to feel really, I was just it had been many months of feeling meh about my job. And I'm somebody who goes with my heart. I love everything that I do. And so if I'm not feeling totally fulfilled, like there's a problem or like that's my inner red flag. Like, okay, we need to investigate a little deeper. So I'd spent some months feeling bad about work and anxious and not great. And I remember walking into this anthropology and thinking, what do I want to do? I don't know if it's nursing anymore. And It was like the clouds parted, the sun shone down on me. And I was like, I'm going to be a colon therapist. (laughs) I went home that day and I Googled schools. And within a couple of weeks, I was enrolled in my certification program. And then I became a colon therapist like very early in 2016. And then I met you very shortly thereafter. So kind of a roundabout way of getting to where I am now. (laughs) You got like a total download right from the universe and anthropology about helping people poop. Very much so. It was, it was so fun. I'm like, and, it, and another reason that I knew that this wonderful man that I met in a bar in Orange County was the one for me. I went home and he was like, how's your day? I said, I'm going to help people poop better. And he looks at me and he hugs me and he's like, honey, you do you. That is so cool that you know what you want to do. And it was just really funny because <laughs> I don't know how many men are like, really? That's really, that's what you want to do. <laughs> but my, my man did. So. <laughs> I love it. Radical acceptance. And you know what? Most people want to poop better. My friend Sandy just posted a reel about that the other day, and she got a lot of traction on it. So, you know, people want to talk about (laughs) poop and sex and hormones. And it's like, yep, let's do that. Let's let's get in there. There's a lot of good work we can do. (laughs) I love it. And I would add money to the list. Like, let's talk about poop, money and sex. That could be my next podcast if I ever get sick of interviewing corporate dropouts. Oh my gosh. Or yes, I love it. Well, I will. I volunteer as tribute to be on that future podcast. (laughs) Uh, All right. So you become a colon hydrotherapist and Mm -hmm. then what happens? You move again. Um, So like take us through the next uh, career twists and turns. Mm -hmm. Love this. Okay. So, so as I became a colon therapist, I was still working in the hospital because nursing was really like paying my bills, you know? And colon therapy was filling my cup. It was feeling, filling everything. Oh my gosh. It was so amazing. I was no so I was working. A, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. So many good poop jokes, so many puns. It's so fun. <laughs> um, and so I was working a lot. I was working like six, seven days a week, a lot of times. Cause you know, I worked the three days in the hospital and on my four days off, I was in the colon therapy office learning and growing and just, again, continuing to have my mind blown, like all day, every day, because people were healing. And it was just crazy to witness. And I mean, we saw some amazing things. And and I started to notice some really powerful shifts in my own body and in my own um, health challenges, which we'll get to in a bit, I'm sure, um, because that's another twist in the story. But um, after we left Orange County, my husband and I moved to Denver, and I was working in interventional radiology. And for those of you who don't know what interventional radiology is, it's... um, procedures done in an OR setting done under the guidance of fluoroscopy, x-ray, and um, we don't cut anybody open, but we operate through needles and catheters, and we can do everything from GI bleeds to placing central lines um, to a whole gamut of other things. And so I was working in that setting in Denver, and I was taking a lot of call. And so for my non-nurses, what that means is you carry a beeper and you wait for the beeper to go off. And you come in in the event the beeper goes off, in the event of an emergency. And um, let me tell you, a lot of emergencies happen in the middle of the night, really dire emergencies like GI bleeds and brain aneurysms and things like, and strokes, things that need medical attention right now. (laughs) And uh, I remember it was my first 22 hour shift. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. I'm, my health is suffering. My anxiety is beyond insane. And it's crazy because I'm not an anxious person. I, I'm really high energy person and I'm go, go, going a lot, but I'm not anxious. I don't experience anxiety. So I was starting to feel that in my body. I was feeling the heart racing and the flushing and the inability to sleep and the, the fear. I mean, if anybody's ever carried a beeper, like they know it's so 
stressful and it's so traumatic. Anyway, so I remember one night taking care of my third GI bleed and I was done. I was like, I can't do this anymore. Oh, and by the way, it's allowed in the state of Colorado to work that long and be expected to like be fully functional, which is just a whole other conversation for another time. But um, I was, I was like, I got to get out. This is not filling me up anymore. In fact, it's really, it's a, it's a detriment at this point. So I Googled health coaching because I had heard the term before and I had started to spend some time just getting really still and a lot of time with my journal. And every time I would write about like what was lifting me up and what was making me come alive. It was teaching people how to heal because that's so much of what I did in the colon therapy office. And I was again, witnessing so much beauty happen and so many people heal. And that's where my heart was leading. And so I Googled what health coaching was. And that very next day I went home and I told my husband that this is what I have to do. And Oh, it was such a powerful moment, Alicia. I remember feeling, you know, that feeling in your heart when you get fluttery, maybe you get a little sweaty and you get so excited and you get full body chills and you just know you are right where you're meant to be. That's what it was. And I said, this is, and, and that has always happened for me in all of these big moments. Like when I knew I was going to be a nurse, when I got my first job in at Hopkins, when I met my husband, um, and then when I, when I became a colon therapist and now becoming a health coach. So that's really been a barometer for me, just following my heart and trusting that feeling of fluttery, sweaty excitement. <laughs> and that's, that's how I became health coach. And then ne- next thing I knew I was enrolled. And then a couple weeks later I was starting the program. And, um, that's, that sort of what was propelling me out of the hospital. I hadn't formally left all the way, but I was now entering into the realm of coaching, learning, getting my certification and knowing that I was going to be exiting very soon. You know, there's something I just picked up on as you're telling this story that I want to dive into a little bit more. I feel like a lot of the time when people have those like light up, I'm in alignment moments. And then whatever that thing was is no longer the thing anymore. They're like, Mm -hmm. oh, well, was my intuition wrong? Mm, And it's like, no, that was a stepping stone that needed to take place, right? Like, do you think, would you be here doing what you're doing had it not been for everything that preceded this? Be, with No, without a doubt, no, I would not. And that's why I feel so grateful whenever I look back on my nursing, even the really challenging icky moments kind of towards the end, I'm so thankful and grateful for it because it led me here. It, it gave me the, you know, I, I see with the eyes of a nurse, I can empathize and sympathize with the heart of somebody who's been through the ringer with patients in their most dire and scary and sad times of their life and their families. And it's, it's, it's so part of me. I will always be a nurse. Even if I don't have my nurse hat on, it's there, it's ingrained in me. And it's such a beautiful journey. And I never once ever felt like, Oh, I I was wrong. I I just, I, I witnessed, I had the wisdom to see that it was wonderful for the time it was wonderful for the people and the experiences and learning. I mean, I love having my nursing knowledge, but that season is over for me and it's okay. And you know, there's, it's a grieving process too. Cause I remember the day I realized I didn't want to be a nurse anymore. I was so sad because I mm-hmm. loved it so much. It was almost like a an abandonment of something I knew so deeply but now I realize, no, it was just, it's like anything else. It's like when you become a woman and you're no longer a girl or you become a mama and you're no longer a maiden or you um, become the wise woman and you're no longer in that season of reproducing. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful symphony of growth and circular forth, forward movement and it's beautiful and sad and it's okay that it's all of that, you know? Yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of the times part of becoming a dropout from whatever you've been doing is shedding the identity that you once held so close. Like, yes. you know, like for me, it was like, my identity is like, I am a top software sales performer. Right. And then that gets taken away by 2020 and all the circumstances. We won't spend time on my story because this is about you, not me. But like, <laughs> it was that identity shift that was really the hardest thing to grasp. And it kind of, it's like a grieving process. Even if you're the one who's choosing it, mm. it still is hard. It is. It's so hard. I love that we're talking about this because there is, and I I think as we kind of come home to ourselves and we learn to get more um, trustworthy of the feelings we're having and where that's coming from, 
I think people need to realize that it's okay to feel that sadness for something that's no longer, you know, like that's what makes it beautiful. Like, have you seen inside out? We can't have joy without sadness. (laughs) And so, um, yeah, I love that we're touching on this and that it's a very common thing. So if you're feeling that and you're leaving an identity that you've attached yourself to for however many years, I mean, hello, my, my bachelor's degree is in nursing. Like what does a nurse do? That's not nursing, you know? So I've definitely had to make that shift as well. And, um, yeah. Yeah. And just, you know, kind of uh, double underlining what you just said about, you know, how can you appreciate joy without sadness? Like we live in in a, a world that has that polarity purposely so that you can you can't appreciate peaks unless you know the depths of the pit. Mm. So I think that that's a really important point. OK, so you move again from Denver <laughs> to the Bay Area. Yes. And and it was in the Bay Area when you officially hung up the, the nursing scrubs. So <laughs> tell us a little bit about, about that and what made you ultimately say goodbye for, well, I won't say for good. There's a long yeah. event horizon in life and you never know, but <laughs> we're good for now. Absolutely. Yes. So after we uh, left Denver in 2019, we moved to Oakland. Uh, we moved here. My husband is from here originally, and it was just a really um, good next move for us. And I became a travel nurse yet again into a hospital where I was working in the neurotrauma ICU. Now you want to talk heavy, Alicia, work in a neurotrauma ICU. It's, it's beyond, it's hard to even articulate the stuff that you see. And I mean, I've worked in some very, very high acuity hospitals. This is, this was one of the the highest acuity. Um, We saw a lot of young people, a lot of accidents, brain injuries, all kinds of things. And, um, the stress again is it was so profound. And I was sort of getting to a place in my own body and my own healing journey, which again, we'll get to in a bit, but, um, I was starting to notice and identify things that were no longer serving me. And, um, after about two years in this role, it became sort of about, okay, how healthy can I be in where I'm going in my health and stay at this job that's really challenging me and becoming more of a burden than it is a blessing, even though I still do view it as a blessing, but you know what I mean. So we moved to the Bay Area. I'm working in this neurotrauma ICU. Um, and it's and it's great, but I, I was really feeling called to pursue my health coaching and see clients one-on-one full time, I was really called to that and functional nutrition and working with people to prevent illness before they became patients in the hospital started to become really, really important to me. And so 2021, uh, September of 2021 to be specific is when I hung up my stethoscope and I decided that this is no longer the right path for me. And I jumped into, um, my formal hospital corporate dropout role officially, um, early September of 2021. And it was like, again, it was, it was sad, but it was so, I knew it was the right choice, um, for me and where I was heading, for myself, for my business, for my family, and for my health. Um, I was experiencing a lot of issues with stress and um, adrenal challenges. And everybody who's on an adrenal healing journey knows that too much stress is not good for those sweet little adrenal glands. So uh, for me, it was it was the right move. And here we are. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about this, I mean, you were making very good money as a nurse. Very good money. And living yeah. in one of the most expensive places in the country. Oh, yes. Yes. Multiple. So, yes. Go ahead. What has it been like going from, you know, racking up some pretty major income as a nurse to now starting over as an entrepreneur? And, ha- you know, it's so it's so uncertain, right? It's like, oh, yeah. one day you can make five figures, another day you make none. Right? <laughs> so what has that transition been like? And how have you coped with the roller coaster? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And I love that we're going there because the money conversation is so key and so important, especially for entrepreneurs. And, you know, it's just, it's so good to talk about. So yeah, I mean, it was, it was kind of a shock. It was, I'm very grateful. Um, my husband, he's been working, so he's been extremely supportive of this decision, 
for me to leave. And, you know, we just like anybody else, you revisit the budget, you revisit uh, your, I don't even like calling it a budget. I call it healthy spending or the um, the healthy spending pyramid. So we've, we've had to make some tweaks and, and certainly um, getting a little comfortable with like a healthy amount of debt because you can't go from, you know, six figure income to nothing and not experience that somewhat in your bank account. So we did some things like we paused some retirement contributions. We paused some, uh, some of that. And that was okay because we had that cushion. We had that buffer and um, yeah, the unpredictability of building a business of starting over of leaving a six figure plus job to having essentially no income overnight was, was a huge thing for me, but it was that discomfort that, I think really helped me understand that we can create, we, we have that power to create opportunities for ourselves. And I remember the day that, Oh God, this is, this is a, we're getting real here. But I remember the day that um, a credit card of mine got declined and I'm 35 years old and never has Mm -hmm. that ever happened to me before. And I remember Mm -hmm. thinking, Holy cow, are we really here? And that moment was, was so profound. I'll never forget it. And I'm so grateful it happened because I got real gritty real quick. And you just, you find ways to create that opportunity for yourself. You sort of hang up your, your hat and you're, you're okay with that discomfort because you're like, listen, I gotta, I'm, I'm going to just say yes to opportunities that maybe I wouldn't have said yes to before. And then they become these beautiful things. And yeah, so you get uncomfortable and sometimes you get gritty and then you realize that, that you, you always have the power. Like, and, th- and that's another thing I want to talk about money for a second. It's money is, there's always going to be a way to make more money always, right? Like we live in a beautiful world of abundance and prosperity, and there's so much to go around for everybody. Do Did I always feel like that, especially in moments like when my credit card's getting declined? Maybe not, but you pull yourself out of that because you think, no, I can actually create this. I can call 10 more people today than I did yesterday, or I can ask for referrals, or I can um, put out publications and get people's eyes on my my work. And that's what I did. And that's when I got started to see sales. That's when I started to see clients coming in. That's when people started to book and see. And I really feel like that shift and lack scarcity, I totally had a lot of that, especially, like I said, not having that six-figure income anymore. Um, feeling that shift from that lack, that scarcity into no, no, it's available to me when I choose it. And, and I did, I I had decided to choose it. And another thing that was really helpful for me in attracting the right kind of person was, um, really magnetizing that person to myself. I got really diligent about, um, writing in my journal. I got really diligent about writing down my goals and being grateful for things that hadn't happened yet. And, meditating on, uh, in the moment and being grateful for the moment, but seeing my future self and seeing what I knew was possible for me. And so much of that was a, was a shift in my thinking because I felt once I realized, no, no, I'm creating this life for myself. I'm not waiting for somebody to create it for me. That's a shift. When you go from being an employee of a, of a business or a hospital into working for yourself, nobody's going to work my business harder than me. Nobody's going to give a crap more than me. And I just needed to, to care that much. And so that was, that was very, very poignant and a very big shift for me (laughs) in my entrepreneurial journey. (laughs) You know, one thing I hear as you're talking is that your faith is so much bigger than your fear. Oh, I just got chills, full body chills hearing you say that. <laughs> well, and you know, like the the credit card declining thing. I, mm. I actually shared this on stories a few weeks ago. I went to go pick up my generic Zoloft prescription. It's like less than $6, you guys. Mm-hmm. And the card declined. And I was like, what? Mm-hmm. It turns out it was an error with the bank. It wasn't maxed out, but it immediately like... It brought me to this place of like, I I needed this to happen to sort of like bring me back down Mm. to earth and to be able to like meet more people where they're at and to Mm. really get hungry as if Mm. it it really did decline, right? So I think sometimes like, again, going back to like the depths of the pit to appreciate the peak, like it's something that is happening for us versus to us can be serious shit in the moment, but it's a blessing. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. That it's, 
And it's taking that, like that feeling. And I, I remember that story that you posted on and you said it was a very triggering moment for you because it reminded you mm-hmm. of the past when you were struggling financially and living, you know, paycheck to paycheck or not even paycheck, credit card to credit card, which I think, you know, a lot of times yeah. some people get into that. And I love that we're sort of making it okay to talk about and hopefully giving some uh, hope to somebody who's maybe there right now, or maybe somebody who's struggling in that, um, that space of, of lack and scarcity. And, and I think that that can, yeah. can serve like in a moment, sometimes for a brief moment, but we can't live there. We can pass by the yeah. scarcity and the lack, but knowing that, that it's temporary, everything is shifting. We can always make more money. Always. We just yeah. get creative. Yeah. And that's part of the beautiful thing of this life is we're always, always creating something, you know? Yeah. There's infinite possibilities, like mm-hmm. truly, um, yeah. But yeah, that can be a hard in the moment at times. You know, yeah. one other thing I wanted to ask you before we we move on, uh, I'm curious how you feel about what I'm about to say. Do you feel like the stress of the financial piece is less than the stress of making bank, but working in the setting that you were in? Yes, 100%. Yes. And I knew I knew what was coming. I knew I, it's funny. Do we do we prophesize or, or make things happen because we preconceive them, you know? I knew it was going to happen. Yeah. I knew we were going to have a little bit of challenge financially because um, I just knew it was. You you can't go in the Bay Area from making six figures to zero and not experience some of that stress. But um, yeah. no, beyond, I, I am so grateful that I left when I did because, um, like I said, the the physical toll that it was taking on me, the mental and emotional toll was becoming too much for me to deal with. It was becoming like, a. it's like not something I'm willing to compromise on anymore. And I know that that feeling came from a place of honoring my body, caring for my body more than I had ever cared for it before witnessing powerful change happening. And then starting to understand, you know what, these two lifestyles are incompatible. I can't live my healthiest, fullest, most vibrant, healthy, sound life while working in this environment. That's not serving me. And so no, this, the money stress was, there was a, there was a bit, but there was far more reprieve. There was far more, ah, oh, this is my new life. And this is what I'm working towards. And and that in and of itself was so good that my, my body, my brain, my bank account was able to take that little hit for a bit because I knew it was temporary. So yeah. I feel the exact same way. I tell Jeff all the time, like, do I miss what I was making? Oh, hell yeah. I mean, I, I, I do, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go back, you know, to the same environment for anything because, um, yeah, it was, it was slowly killing me. I'd probably have autoimmune disease or something by now if I hadn't left, like truly. Absolutely. Like, and the body will always beg that you tell the truth, whether you're, whether you're not being honest about your work environment, your relationship, your home, where you live, like it's the body will always tell you. And you had the wisdom to leave when shit hit the fan. Sorry, swearing on your podcast, but no, you can swear (laughs) (laughs) when, when you had that you, and you have the wisdom to look back and say, no, this is probably what would have happened. Yeah. Same, Same. And, and I think, I think that you are lighting a path for other people to experience that as well. And, and almost having that, um, I don't want to say premonition, but like knowing that this isn't, if this isn't going to get better, like it's going to lead to something bigger than I can handle. And that's, that's huge. Especially, you know, if you have a little one at home, like I didn't want my daughter seeing me be chronically anxious and depressed and every, you know, the litany of other physical things that I knew would follow. And, um, a coach that, that Emily and I have worked with the retreat that we were on together was with Kayla Craft, And she shared with me once that the body whispers before it screams. So if you are listening to this and your body is whispering to you, Mm -hmm. listen to it before it screams to force you to pay attention. Oh my gosh. Full body chills again. Wow. Yes. And that is, (laughs) (laughs) that is so amazing. So, so speaking of that, like talk to us a little bit about like restoring the body. So like one of the things that Emily does, y'all, she helps women heal their hormones. So like I have so many friends that have struggled with PCOS, with infertility, with endometriosis. She helps naturally heal those things with food, lifestyle changes, and all the things we talked about in her bio. So share a little bit about that. Like 
what are some of the things that people could do like right here and now to start listening to their body and to bring Mm -hmm. it back into its full expression and health? Oh my gosh. Great question. I love that we're moving in here. Um, well, if it's okay with you, I want to just share just a little piece about, um, my hormone healing journey and what led me here. Um, so I was actually diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS in 2014 after many, many months of 40 to 60 day cycles, random bleeding, uh, pretty serious PMS, pretty serious skin issues. And, some other, some other things were going on as well, but it was, it was a pretty, uh, rattling thing when she was like, yeah, you have, you have PCOS. I went to my doctor. I was really surprised because everybody, you know, PCOS is a very typical body type or is so we were taught all these years ago, there, there's been a lot of progress and a lot of changes that have come with so many women having PCOS now, but I didn't believe her really. I was like, really, I don't look like somebody who has PCOS. Um, but I did lo and behold, my laboratory work and my ultrasounds, they definitely showed PCOS and everything was very consistent with that finding. And when I asked her if there was anything I could do to heal my body naturally, or were there dietary changes I could make or anything like that? She said, no, here's metformin, a diabetes drug to manage my insulin resistance. Um, here's spironolactone, which is a diuretic to help with my androgen excess, hence the, um, cystic acne and that kind of thing. And then she said, and if you ever want babies someday, like you're probably not going to get pregnant because, um, PCOS is the leading cause of infertility in women. So don't worry, we've got some IVF and some IUI for you when that time comes. And I remember thinking, hell to the no, this is not, a, no, this, and this is what, right after I had started learning all about holistic health and wellness. And so I was like, meh, that doesn't work for me. And I remember going home and feeling a lot of frustration at that answer and like, no, I'm going to figure this out. So more synchronicity, more people leading me to, to other people. And basically I found, um, I found that no PCOS is highly manageable through diet and lifestyle. So it's been a long journey for me, but I have, I don't have PCOS anymore. My labs are perfect. My uh, ovaries are perfect. I actually conceived naturally in my bed, in the embrace of my husband without (laughs) assisted reproductive technology. So it can be done. And I witnessed it happen in my own body. And so that, that, that's what got me on the path of hormone healing because I, I saw what was possible with intentional action, with prioritizing your health and with learning, like we underestimate how powerful just spending some time learning, maybe not every day, but you know, if that, you know, it was for me learning something every day was really helpful, whether I'm reading or podcasting or what have you. And before you know it, I felt I was feeling better and my, my brain was clearer and my skin improved and my periods restored and I was ovulating again and my PMS symptoms disappeared and all of these really powerful things were happening. And so, um, that's, that's why hormones that, that is why. And the more women know how much power they have in healing themselves through beautiful life-giving nutrient dense foods and sustainable lifestyle choices and non-negotiable de-stressing and self-care and all of that beautiful stuff that we talk about, it's possible. I'm living proof that it is possible. And so if a woman who is struggling with hormonal imbalances is listening I want to say that the first thing that I would do with regard to restoring my body to optimal health, I would start to pay attention to everything. How does, how do, how does this food or this food make me feel? How does it feel in my body? How does my energy feel after consuming it? How are my stress levels? What is making my stress worse? What is making it better? What is the quality of my sleep? What is the quality of my bowel movements? What is the quality of my period? How is my sex drive? How are my energy levels? Just all of these things that we kind of take for granted and don't really know to pay attention to. This is all wisdom from the body. The body is far more intelligent than we could ever even believe. It is always trying to come back into balance. And the truth, (laughs) the truth is that it will always heal when you feed it well and you give it the resources it needs to rebuild, repair, and renew. And I think that the first step is just getting in tune with that and, and trusting what's coming up for you. So if you're somebody who every time she eats a turkey club, she's got bloating, indigestion, brain fog, and she breaks out and she's gassy, well, maybe we need to investigate gluten. Maybe gluten's a problem for you. Or 
maybe you're a gal who drinks coffee and like she has the heart race and she's like, oh, she's buzzing a million miles a minute. Maybe you're somebody who's not as good at metabolizing caffeine and maybe we need to investigate that a little further. Maybe you're a gal who, who's tired but wired and she can't fall asleep at night. And when she does wake up, she's, um, she's, she's sluggish and she needs two buckets of coffee to get going in the morning and it takes her hours to feel good. These are all things that we can really hone in on and, and start paying attention to because that's where we can make the biggest changes and see progress when we make these positive changes and then they result in fewer symptoms. So, Oh my gosh. I have, okay, I have so many thoughts. All right. One is I, for those who don't know, my dad shared this with me a long time ago and it appalled me. So Western medicine has its place certainly, but did you know, well, Emily, you know this, for the <laughs> listeners who don't, did you know in medical school, there's only one hour of nutrition that's given? You can, that's are you fact checking me on that? That's right. It, it, that's <laughs> correct, isn't it? Oh, oh, it is. It is. There's, um, it's, and it's, a, it's, blah, it's an elective at, at many schools, wow. but we don't always have to. And I'm unclear of the exact statistic, but there's not many who make it required learning. So you're right. Yeah. What, wasn't it um, Hippocrates that said, uh, let medicine be thy food and food be thy medicine? You or got maybe it. I have that reversed. Yeah, let food Which, be thy you know, medicine. Where the Hippocratic Oath comes um, from to do mm -hmm. no harm? Mm hmm. That's, uh, yeah, it, you're exactly are. right. <laughs> yes, it's. I've uh, gone down this rabbit hole. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm loving every second. So, <laughs> no, it's, um, I'm glad that you brought that up because, yes, there is a time and a place for Western medicine, for allopathic medicine. And I'm so grateful we are living in a time where we have that. If I break my arm, I'm probably not going to take some herbs to fix my arm. I'm probably going to go to the ER and get it, get it set <laughs> and what have you. But, we don't focus enough on prevention. We don't focus enough on, um, uh, yeah, on prevention through things like food and lifestyle. And I, I don't know the exact statistic, but stress is probably the most insidious thing in our world now. And it, uh, it, it accounts for a lot of the reasons for ER visits and a lot of issues that a lot of people mm -hmm. experience. But Yes. And mm -hmm. our physicians are fantastic. I'm grateful we have them, um, but they're trained in knowing what's, what can go wrong with the body. Health coaching, holistic health and wellness is trained in what can go right with the body. And that mm -hmm. is the difference. That is, and, that, and that's why we both need each other. I don't know why every doctor's office in the country mm -hmm. doesn't have a health coach to teach somebody how to eat well yeah. and how to use the right supportive foods to help things like hypertension and keeping that blood sugar stabilized and to lower inflammation. Well, actually, I do know why, but yeah. we're we're shifting. We're creating a big shift because um, yeah. this is the new. This is what's happening. There's a lot of coaches out there now. There's a lot of people who are aware of some of the crazy notions that um, that exist in in our time. And I'm so I'm so excited to see what happens because more and more people are taking control of their health. They are saying yes to them being the authority on their health. Because I'm here to tell everybody here listening that there is no greater authority on your health than you. And yes, I'm grateful for our doctors and they have a time and a place, but nobody knows you better than you. And if anybody's trying to tell you that, my question is why? Maybe there's a reason why they don't want you being your own authority in your health. <laughs> so, um, because yes. I will say that when you're when you heal through food and lifestyle, like I did, guess what I'm not doing? Spending 20 grand on IVF. Guess what I'm not doing? Filling a prescription for metformin and spironolactone every single month. You know what I mean? So that's, yep. that's where the empowerment piece comes in. A hundred percent. I mean, it is, you know, and again, like I'm grateful for Western medicine. I wouldn't even be alive if it wasn't for it. Um, exactly. However, it is a business and mm -hmm. there's not a lot of money to be made if everyone is healthy and well all the time, which is why mm -hmm. if y'all haven't figured it out yet, the mm -hmm. FDA doesn't give a shit about you. Um, <laughs> we could go down that rabbit hole. We won't, but like, Mic that's drum. why you have to make the good decisions, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so, so for the, the woman who's listening, that's like, okay, yeah, like I know that things aren't optimal. Like, what would you suggest is the place to start in terms of keeping track? Like, do you do a food diary? Like what, what would you say is the best way to really start tap, tapping into your, what your body's trying to tell you? I suggest every single woman who has a period or doesn't have a period and wants a period, any, any woman in her reproductive years, 
track her cycle. How long do you go between periods? What is the quality of that period? Do you have pain? Do you have mood swings? Do your breasts hurt premenstrually? Um, how is your sex drive? Do you have fertile cervical mucus? All of these things are really good information. And it's, it's a great window into our health. I always tell people that your period is one of the most powerful indicators of your underlying health, because the hallmark of a healthy woman is a healthy period. If you're not having a healthy period, if you're not having a period, if you're not ovulating, there's a, there's a problem. And this is a message from the body. So tracking the cycle is huge. Um, I, I love food. Food is, I'm always a food first approach kind of girl. And so if you're somebody who doesn't feel great most of the days, or you're noticing, or you just feel in, intuitively that something isn't quite right. Absolutely. I think keeping, keeping a food diary, keeping a food journal is a great way. Um, and just, just start by noticing you, you'll, you'll find, you'll know, you'll know when something isn't quite sitting right. Like, I don't know, like I mentioned, like the Turkey club, if you're like somebody who has bread and they don't feel great after or all of these things, that's probably alerting us to that. There's a problem. So paying attention, charting your cycle and that, yeah, that's where I would start because it's all information where we need to be detectives, especially if we're going to be empowered in healing ourselves and taking back control of our health and wellness. We need to know what's happening in our bodies. Do you typically recommend people start with removing inflammatories like um, common ones being, you know, gluten, dairy, um, soy, like artificial sweeteners, like highly processed stuff. Is that a pretty good place to begin? That's a great place to begin. Yes. Um, I tell my clients that anything that comes from a package, we, and anything that you can't pronounce, we need to step away from that. Um, yes, gluten is a, is a problem for most people, even if you're not a celiac or diagnosed celiac. Um, we know that there's a lot of issue with gluten. We also know that inflammatory oils like canola seed oil, vegetable oil, these are really, really processed, bad, bad inflammatory. I don't even want to call them foods because they're not foods, but they need to go. <laughs> so yes, getting rid of things that are inflammatory, like um, processed foods and inflammatory oils and anything that's inflammatory, like smoking is very inflammatory. Being extremely stressed out is also inflammatory. Um, things, things like this, they're all going to contribute to that chronic low grade stress. That's, it's kind of, I think of a campfire, you know, how when a campfire is, you know, big and beautiful and it's erupting and it's really nice to sit by, but then we're ready to go to bed and those embers, they just glow and it's not quite out. That's what chronic low grade inflammation is doing to the body. It's never, the fire is never quite out, but it's not raging. You might not have symptoms or maybe it's, you don't have a full blown medical diagnosis yet, but there's that chronic inflammation that's existing underneath the surface. that's driving problems. So anything inflammatory is going to exacerbate that managing your blood sugar is going to be hugely anti-inflammatory, getting enough sleep. It brings it back to the basics the, that are so foundational that I honestly won't even work with somebody unless they're willing to do the, the basics because you can have all the most beautiful, expensive, really high quality supplements in the world. But if you're not implementing the basics, we can only get so far for your health. Like you're going to feel great on these high quality things, but we're never going to achieve that level of absolute healing unless you're doing those foundational things like sleeping seven to nine hours a night, eating nutrient dense foods, managing your stress, moving your body, getting outside, detoxifying, um, filling your life with joy and love and, and, in a spiritual practice, like that is so healing. And most people who implement some of those basics, they feel better very soon. And it's wonderful to witness, you know, cause that's the power of the foundations. I, I'm imagining a lot of people who just heard the things you rattled off would be like, well, man, you know, I don't have time to sleep seven hours mm. or seven to nine hours. And I don't have time to not buy processed foods and make everything. But you know, there's a saying, I might be getting it a bit wrong, but it's like, if you're not making time for wellness now, you're going to have to make time for illness later. That's exactly right. I know that's easier said than done, though. I'm certainly not perfect, um, quite of far course. from it when it comes to all of that. But you have to be cognizant of what you're consuming. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And sometimes that's where it starts is like just being aware of 
maybe how many times, you know, are you somebody who eats out seven times a week or five times a week and that kind of thing, you know, just being aware of it. Cause once we know we can make those positive shifts to make things a little bit more health focused. So now is, is eating out, do, am I somebody who never goes out to a restaurant? Heck no. I, I indulge. I love going to restaurants. I love all of that, but um, most of my life. Yeah. I, I do try to implement those healthy girl habits as I call them or healthy guy habits. You know, I work primarily with women, so it kind of rattles off my, my tongue a little easier, but you're right. Like a lot of people will say, no, I don't have time to sleep seven to nine hours of sleep. I've got a child who doesn't sleep through the night or I'm a busy working mom. I, I don't have time to cook from scratch every single night or somebody who's on a tight budget. I don't have, I can't buy all the supplements you're suggesting or do all of the things. And that's okay. And we, we meet people where they are. And so I always like to, I like to make things accessible and I like things to be doable because if we don't make things doable, then people aren't going to do them and we're not going to see the results that we want to see. So if it's doable, for example, um, making a crock pot dish twice a week and making enough to just heat up and it, and it, cause it's there and it's easy and it's a whole food and it's cooked in your house and it's got all the yummy, good oils or the good fats that you've made. And it's not made by somebody else. Then that's a win. That's a huge win. If you're yeah. somebody who can, uh, maybe you can't buy all organic, but maybe you can buy like organic from the journey dozen list, or maybe you can buy, um, some grass fed and finished meat. If you're not buying all the processed things, like we meet mm-hmm. you where you are because everything is doable when, when we know that we need to do it, you know? Um, yeah. so that's a really big thing. Cause you want to, yeah, you want to make these changes sustainable because that's where we see the, the health, the long-term health benefits. Yeah. And maybe easing into it, you know, you're not going to go from eating McDonald's every night to like, uh, you know, living like a paleo <laughs> lifestyle or something or, you know, whatever it is, yes. right? Like it needs to be, you need to ease in or it won't absolutely. stick. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why I always work with my clients on a gradient. You know, if you're drinking 10 cups of coffee a day, I'm not going to say, Hey, let's cut coffee. <laughs> we'll say, <laughs> Hey, maybe, maybe one day this week, let's have nine cups of coffee. Every other day of the week, you can still have your 10 cups. But if one day we only do nine, that's a win. And yeah. that's, you know, so it's these baby steps that empower people. And then they, then when they start to feel better, just by making these tiny incremental changes, that's where we get the momentum. And even something that seems like as small as that to you and me, that's huge in the world of somebody who's drinking tons of cups of coffee a day, or yeah. it's just a beautiful thing. Cause then people feel empowered. And then that's when they keep going. And that's when they sing your praises because they're like, this person helped me get to my level of health, holy cow. And that's the whole point. We want to help everybody have infinite health. And yeah, that's the whole point. Yeah, I absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, what good is it living if, if, you know, you're in terrible health and feel, t- I mean, <laughs> you know, like we, we have to keep that vitality. Well, yeah. this was awesome. Okay. So you're coming back to do a mini episode with us that'll drop tomorrow. So everyone be sure to come back for that. You're going to be telling us about following your curiosity in order to find your soul's purpose, which if y'all can't tell, she found it. You can hear it in her <laughs> voice. <laughs> oh. Um, And I wanted to close with like, plug away, like how can people work with you? You have uh, a few different programs. You have a course. How can they work with you, connect with you and all of that good stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm really active on Instagram and I'm always dropping tons of free content and really great information on just how to be more empowered in your health and healing. And you can find me at emily.ann.woodward. That's my Instagram handle. And if you wanted to work with me in a private one-on-one session, I offer two packages for my coaching clients. We do three months together or six months together. And those are, those are amazing because, uh, I work with women with hormone imbalances and I like the three month program because it's almost a hundred days. It's like 90 days and it takes 90 to a hundred days for the egg that you're going to ovulate to, to become its optimal health. So we need a hundred days together to get those eggs as healthy as possible. So that's why I only offer this six, uh, sorry, the three month uh, package at a minimum, but I love a six month program because we really see phenomenal changes together in the six months. And if you're somebody who's got some serious problems, or maybe you do have a formal diagnosis, we probably need that long because things happen in six months, you know, um, barbecues happen, holidays happen, we fall off the wagon, we get back on the wagon. It's a really good amount of time to see sustainable as results. 
And um, if one-on-one coaching isn't something that is resonating at the time, I also have an online course called the Hormone Healing Secrets. It is a six-week course and it literally is the roadmap for everything I use to heal my polycystic ovarian syndrome, restore ovulation, restore my energy and my sex drive, and ultimately conceive my baby. We sadly miscarried a couple of years ago, but um, I'm grateful to know that my body can do it. And that was so wonderful. And that was a huge, um, huge thing for me, just knowing that, no, no, healing happened. And so I just, I feel closer and closer every day and it's a beautiful thing. So six weeks, it's my exact roadmap. We cover food, sugar, blood sugar balance, detoxification, stress, gut health, and menstrual cycle magic and sex fertility and libido. And it's a, it's a really comprehensive course. It is not a quick fix. It is not a silver bullet. It is for the gal who believes in the innate ability of her body to heal. And it does come with some one-on-one coaching with me as part of that purchase. So, um, and yeah, I have a free webinar and a training regarding that. So, um, all of this can be found in the link in my bio on Instagram or at my website, emilyannwoodward.com. And she spells Anne the right way with an E at the end. That's how my mom spells it. So that's why oh, I'm really? saying it that way. That's how, that's her joke. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, it's spelled right. If it has an E at the end. Well, if anyone's listening to this, like I just had the the vision of like people listening that are maybe about to pursue IVF or maybe they're on that journey now. Like I just, I feel like I'm going to get some DMs or you might get DMs from this like a year or beyond being like, Emily healed me and I just conceived naturally. So I hope that you all reach out to Emily if, uh, if you're on that journey. Oh, it gives me all the good feels. Me too. Right? Like, yeah, oh, yeah. you're, you're changing the world. Seriously. Thank so you. Emily, thank you for being on. This was a pleasure. I'm excited for our next interview and we'll see you back here tomorrow. This episode was brought to you by Thea Collective, the learning community I founded for entrepreneurs. Text biz, that's B-I-Z to 949-577-8709 or head to thea-collective.com. That's T-H-E-I-A-collective.com to learn more. Thanks for listening to the show. If you enjoyed today's episode, please help me get the word out about the corporate dropout by screenshotting and sharing this on social. I would appreciate it so much if you would subscribe and leave a five-star rating and review as well. And I do this show for you and I want to hear from you. So tell me, what is it that you want more of? Text me at 949-541-0951 or slide into the DMs at Corporate Dropout Official or Alicia Citro with two underscores. Until next time time.